All right, so we're, we're stepping on the third rail today. We are talking about the most controversial medicine known to man, vaccine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're very excited uh, to have joining us Dr. Gregory Poland. He's the director of the Mayo Clinic's Vaccine Research Group. Pleasure. Dr. Saad Omer, director of the Yale Institute for Global Health. Thank you. And Zainab Tufechi, professor at uh, Columbia University, columnist at the New York Times, and a uh, Pulitzer finalist for bringing clarity to the shifting official guidelines uh, about the pandemic. Thank you. Thank you all so much uh, for, for joining us. Uh, I want to start out with a, uh, a disclaimer, I am a, I am a science feeding man. I believe <laughs> uh, vaccines may be, uh, along with antibiotics, the most miraculous invention uh, for public health in the 20th century. But I too have questions and, and I am confused. And full disclosure, I have been vaccinated, I think, it's got to be four times. Uh, I get a flu vaccine every year. Uh, so I am, I am a believer. But I am also, uh, I get fearful when I hear certain things about myocarditis or when uh, the sands shift beneath us between the vaccine will eradicate this disease and, well, it will lessen your symptoms. So I, I, I wanna give you guys an opportunity first to just m make a statement about uh, the vaccine, this conversation and all that. And we'll start with Dr. Poland. Well, John, what I heard you say, I would call discerning wisdom. Uh, I, think yes, everything, I, think, right. I think everything you said was absolutely correct and it was very well said. Um, I've been a vaccinologist for 40 years. Okay. I would echo exactly what you said. Obviously, I'm a, a fervent supporter of vaccines. The data supports that it has been one of three things that has most prolonged the human lifespan and reduced suffering and disease and death. But we are right to have questions. We are right to be discerning. We are right to be skeptical. And communication style should reflect where we mm -hmm. know and where we don't know information. And uh, I imagine that's what we'll really get into and talk about today. That, 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 that's exactly right. Uh, uh, Dr. Omer. Yeah, so vaccines have uh, been some of the most effective public health interventions. I, that's what I do. I work on vaccines, various aspects of vaccines. But those of us who actually work closely with vaccines are, you know, somewhat paradoxically more respectful of people asking questions. There's nothing wrong with asking questions. Where you go with those questions, what you do with these questions is, is another story. Um, and you know, in, in the public discourse, uh, we have somehow evolved into having this dichotomy of pro versus anti-vaccine. Correct. Where, whereas you have a whole range of perspectives on vaccines. And in fact, we know from data for, for several years, at least a couple of decades, that only a small, small per, uh, fraction of people, two to 3% usually in a given year, is gung-ho anti-vaccine. There's a bigger chunk of people who are the so-called fence sitters mm -hmm. uh, who have questions. Um, some of them are answered satisfactor satisfactorily or others are not and all of that stuff. And then there's a huge chunk of people who don't wake up every morning and think about vaccines. Uh, oh, I don't, I don't know that that's true, Dr. Omer. I think, <laughs> I think well, wait, every, every morning I wake up and I, and I think about uh, vaccines. Uh, Professor Tefechi. So I think it's almost like it's a victim of its success, right? Uh, vaccines have completely transformed what childhood is like. If you walk by any cemetery, read any history books, just look at anything in the pre-vaccine era, you find that so many children died. I have a friend who had who got polio because very unluckily his family was away the week the vaccine was given when he was a kid, and he's one of the last polio victims in Turkey because of that. So, like I, we've lost the connection to what it was like before. But with many things that succeed, you forget that there's a lot of effort that goes into making it work. 
And once it succeeds, of course, we want it to be even safer and even better. It's kind of like you want to, so our standards are higher. So when vaccines first came around, people took it. They lined up their kids and cried with joy, even though the safety standards were lower. To be honest, like at first, but certainly it was, trust in institutions was higher was, back in those yeah. days. Well, I but also say. we didn't know as much because at the time they were preventing something so horrible that mm-hmm. people kind of were like, it was very obvious to people that whatever risk there was, it was less than the illness. But as time passed, as we made the vaccine safer and safer and safer, mm-hmm. and the illness got less and less and less because of the vaccines becoming so widespread, people have kind of lost this sort of balance between, yes, you have to study the trade-offs, you have to study the risks, you have to make sure it's as safe as possible. But what people have lost sight of, I think, is the other side of the equation, which is these horrific diseases that luckily people are not tested with Mm -hmm. because so many of kids and people are vaccinated. So this is what I worry about. I think there is a solution, unfortunate solution, a tragic solution, if the anti-vaxxers succeed, is that we will see horrible, horrific outbreaks Mm -hmm. that kill so many kids in such a horrible way that it's going to be a wake-up call. And we're not going to have to argue back and forth like this because it's going to be right in front of everybody's eyes at tragic cost. And the whole reason I think we have to have these conversations and answer the questions and explain the safety and talk about the trade-offs and what we do is to make sure that the lesson doesn't happen that way, that we prevent the sort of learning by uh, human tragedy. Well, let me me go to something Dr. Omer said, because I think this this speaks to what he's talking about. Uh, You said there's probably about two to three percent of people that are just hardcore no vaccines for a variety of reasons. I mean, this has been for years now, there's been a growing movement on the far right and the far left uh, that is very vaccine skeptical, very much about natural immunity, you know, a a lot of different issues. And we're probably not going to get into a whole lot today. But I do want to get into kind of a postmortem, as post as you can get for a pandemic that's still going. Uh, Because for that two to three percent of hardcore uh, folks who are very active on social media can be, let's face facts, brutal on social media and, and threats and all kinds of other things that, that come their way. But the response from the powers that be, the people that, that have the information, really was certainty. And and when you when you start out with certainty, and I'll, I'll I'll liken it to something, and and this may be the worst analogy that any of you have ever heard. The two calamities of my adult life have been 9-11 and the pandemic. Both, I feel like, had their mission accomplished moment where they stood behind a banner and it's over. And slowly, facts on the ground began to shift and sort of laid waste to that certainty and that sort of moment on on a boat. But rather than deal with it, in an upfront manner, it was dealt with either with condescension or with shaming or with anybody who questioned it. There was no discerning between the two to 3% who would never take a vaccine and the quite large number of people who thought this is brilliant, but wait, I have to get another one. Wait, but it doesn't handle that very, oh wait, but I was told this cures the So it doesn't cure it. You can still pass it. And so all these things start to come up and it becomes a victim of the very certainty of the powers that be. And these suspicions are not crazy. These are not crazy things to be nervous about. So how do we, how do we in a postmortem have a more adult conversation with people and not just shut them down? So so that's a really good question. Um, just to clarify, the 2 to 3% is the usual uh, vaccine refusal. I see. Uh, uh, in COVID, what was alarming was it was a bit higher, but it was around 7 to 9%. Uh, okay. Even that wasn't like 30%, 40%. There were a lot of others who had questions but were persuadable. The first thing was that uh, pandemic has been a communications amateur hour, public health communications amateur hour. Mm-hmm. My research group, um, was concerned because this wasn't um, 
our first rodeo in terms of even a pandemic, let alone an outbreak. We were we had done a lot of work during the H1N1 pandemic mm -hmm. that we had concerns enough to ask the question, what will be the vaccine acceptance? So early May 2020, we did a national survey of, to gauge um, vaccine acceptance of the forthcoming vaccine. And we found was that only 67% of the people would accept the vaccine right away. There was a small fraction. This is in the, this is in the early stages of the pandemic when it was really raging. It was raging, and we projected it to a few months. It, nobody had the exact date available because, as you remember, everyone was projecting a little bit later. So we presented these scenarios. There are systematic ways of gauging people's mm -hmm. uh, attitudes, and we found that um, not only that uh, it was sixty-seven percent, uh, but also. There were three factors, three, four factors. We created a so-called statistically predictive model of mm -hmm. vaccine acceptance. One was region. The other one was, was education, age, and then race. And all of these things turned out to be prescient. That's the magic of uh, measuring things in advance. And a lot of us were jumping up and down saying that, look, we are coming up with this technology, which is wonderful. So I do vaccine trials as well. I do the other side of vaccines as well. And I was really excited about it, but we need to absolutely pay attention to these human factors. And I said that on, I don't know, I think Dr. Poland were, was on these calls with uh, with the Operation Warp Speed. A lot of us spoke up on these calls. Right. But wasn't that the first mistake? Would, why would you Why would you name something that is, you know, that people are hesitant about Warp Speed? Doesn't that... that, that why don't you just name it going as fast as we can and it not a, paying attention to what might happen? It was an unfortunate name, I, I, I think, um, and, and gave the illusion that corners were being cut and things like mm -hmm. that. But to your point, John, I, I really do think that these are discussions that should be approached with, if you will, scientific and intellectual humility. Um, we don't Boy, know. humility. What a what a perfect word to describe uh, what 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 didn't happen. In fact, I, I will tell you in my four decade long career as a as a vaccinologist, I, I describe this as a matrix. There are so many factors changing mm -hmm. so quickly over time that we we need to admit in in many ways we're we're building the airplane while we're flying it. Right. Um, people are doing the, the best they can, but the distortion of the pandemic by human behavior has made this uh, much more difficult. But that implies a burden on us as public health officials, as physicians, Correct. scientists, to, to give some voice to those uncertainties, to the humility that we should have in describing this to a public that is um, rightly skeptical. So let me jump in as the social scientist here. Uh, I always joke that, you know, I'm a I'm a doctor too, technically, but I always joke like in an emergency, I can do an emergency lit review. If they ever call for a doctor, I can like <laughs> read important. the literature really fast. Very important. But, there, but in this particular case, it actually turned out to be very important. Uh, from the beginning, um, sort of social scientific understanding of how people behave, why they behave, how authorities behave, was put to the side. And this is a major problem, I have to say, with public health. And with all due respect to the two um, actual useful doctors mm -hmm. on the panel with us, um, it is a problem with the field of medicine as well. There is a lot of um, not trusting the public not leveling with the public, hmm. not talking about the uncertainty, and just trust us attitude that is very common among public health practitioners in places of power, that is very common among medical doctors as well. I'm not saying all of them. I have great, like some of my best friends are medical doctors once again. Certainly not Dr. Omer or Dr. Poland. They're, they're beyond reproach. <laughs> Why would we even be thinking of that? No, of course not. But so, so this, is, this is the thing is that, so it is of course very understandable to say what the heck is going on. In fact, uh, I ended up writing 
a piece for the New York Times on the unvaccinated because I was so upset that they were being portrayed solely as the crazies Mm -hmm. that you could easily find on Twitter spouting nonsense. And I was like, where is the research? Who are these people? What's going on? And when I dug in as a social scientist and looked at what research was available, what I found was a small number of people who were genuinely irrational and just had decided this was their culture war. But for most people, they were confused. In this country, we don't have great health insurance, and a lot of people do not have a regular doctor. They do not have regular access, and the uninsured were most likely to be um, unvaccinated. Unvaccinated. They they didn't have somebody to ask. I found a lot of people who were confused. They were afraid of COVID. They were afraid of the vaccine. They didn't know who to ask. They saw the shifting guidance that wasn't properly explained, and we saw this again and again Mm -hmm. on things like masks, on things like um, infection-based immunity, on things like myocarditis risk. We did not get, look, here's the best of our knowledge. Here's what we changed. Here's what we got. We got the sort of very certain speak that then shifted and then shifted again. And then pretended it didn't shift. Because I have a son. I, I looked it up. I had to make the decision, you know, Moderna versus Pfizer, all those things. There's a lot of nuance that hasn't been communicated. Here's an example. So the highest risk for myocarditis, and if as you're pointing out, is is men in the 16 to 17-year-old age. If we give a That's million right. doses. My son. My yeah, son. Yeah. If we give yeah. a million doses of an mRNA vaccine, we prevent 57,000 cases of COVID-19, 500 COVID-related hospitalizations, and 170 COVID-related intensive care unit admissions. The price we pay is 73 cases of vaccine-associated myocarditis. Now, most of those are, are benign. In fact, if we hospitalize them, we hospitalize them more often than not to, to assuage our, our, our own fear. There's a rare mm-hmm. one that can be more, uh, more significant, but it is, that, it is that teeter-totter I was talking about. And you know what it ends up being is your own psychological predisposition. Is it the mm-hmm. sin of omission or the sin of commission? I have literally walked out of the consulting room with one mother saying, if something happened to little Johnny because I gave him this vaccine, I could never forgive myself. I go into the next room sure. and the mom says, how could I not give little Ashley this vaccine? If she got COVID and something happened, I could never forgive myself. And there's the nuance that we've been talking about. We have not equipped the public, no. even the public health authorities who, who are discussing this with that right. kind or that level of communication and 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 detail, but the real lesson there is apparently parents cannot forgive themselves. Yeah. No matter John, what they do. Yeah. 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 Here's another no thing: in choice. other countries, they also talk about how to lower the risk. So we have great research from Canada and a couple other countries mm-hmm. that if you space it to at least two months, so between the prime, the first vaccine to like two to three months. And also use Pfizer, which is lower dose than Moderna. So in a lot of other countries, they said there's a tiny little risk, but to avoid it, you should space the vaccine and men under 40 should get Pfizer rather than Moderna. Right. That is straightforward, scientific. That's what other sane countries did. And that's like as a child, as a mother of a son, I, I did the same research. I'm like, why aren't they telling us? Never been communicated. I hate saying this because I want the CDC to succeed. I want them to be much better. But I'll give you a non-vaccine uh, example mm-hmm. is that for the longest time, the U.S. wouldn't approve rapid tests for clinical, non-clinical like home purposes because the FDA argued people would do wrong things with it? Like what? Like test themselves? What? Swab the ear. You'd go, you'd do the ear. They would be like, they can't interpret it unless a doctor is That's involved. Right. I was like, are you kidding me? And then, because like, of course people can, you explain to them, here's the false positive, here's what it means, right. here's what you do, and let people make their, empower people. And finally, when we approved them, it became gung-ho and we're going to give everybody lots of rapid tests and great. And then when Omicron hit, when there was a shortage, CDC started saying, we're not really sure we can trust rapid tests for like ending isolation. I'm like, how convenient. Right. Just when we have a shortage, you change your mind again. Like as a person 
who loves these institutions. And wants them to do better. Mm -hmm. This was the most painful thing to watch mm -hmm. over and over. And again, very, very much respect to the clinicians that are at the front lines, the two medical doctors here. The whole... Um, the I mean the tragedy of the long COVID patients who are still left behind and denied very often by their own doctors. There's a lot of these things where patients are not treated as partners, and then it feels mm -hmm. the worst people who use these weaknesses right. not to try to make this all better the way I want to. They use it to fuel their grift, their ideology, their nonsense, right. which is going to get people killed. Doctor Doctor Poland, you want to jump in? I Dr. Yeah. Poland's been waiting patiently. Yes, sir. Zainab, I, I, I would endorse what you're saying, and it extends beyond that. My, my daughter is a mental health and trauma specialist. She and I have written a few papers on this uh, last summer in the Yale Journal of Biology and Medicine, and we talked about the distortion of pandemics by human behavior, whether we're talking about institutional behavior, public health officials, um, the medical authorities, wh whoever it may be. Ironically, right before the pandemic started, and I have sat and been a participant in many tabletop exercises, we did an international tabletop exercise in Washington, D.C. The one area that we can't get focus on is on the whole anthropology, sociology, and psychology around pandemics. Mm -hmm. Well, about healthcare in general. Yes, and that is what distorted this. Dr. Omer. Yeah, so if I may build on Professor Tafikchi's point, it's, it's absolutely correct that the face of the medical establishment and the face of public health establishment was not communicating. The folks that were presenting the face of, of these entities were not communicating effectively. But I would mm -hmm. add a little bit of nuance. Look, th these are individual people. And what happened during the pandemic was a lot of people within these organizations and outside these organizations without actual experience on communicating, on, uh, you know, without the background and training uh, that was relevant to a public health response were not the face of the pandemic. I'll give you an example. I would not have imagined that the uh, Anne Shuckett, for example, deputy director for the CDC, one of the most experienced folks um, during the pandemic um, uh, that was available to the CDC, uh, Nancy Missionier, the person who sounded the alarm earlier on, mm -hmm. um, these people have been involved with anthrax uh, response, with Ebo Ebola response, with H1N1 response. Mm -hmm. None of them were utilized to their full extent by the establishment. So they weren't the face of, of the pandemic response. So, so that's what I talk about, like very sincere um, inclusion of mm -hmm. expertise that was, a lot of it wasn't relevant and not taking advantage of the experience we had within the government. Agreed. Let me proffer two things because I think it's, you know, and again, we may be over intellectualizing something where there are certain obvious things that, that kind of stare us in the face. One is the face of the pandemic and many of the people that came out, and, and this is something that we see in every industry and perhaps the medical community needs to uh, rethink that sort of revolving door, but it may seem like, well, that's just how business is done and wouldn't they want the expertise on their boards and those boards pay those things. But that kind of conflict of interest fuels mistrust. It does in every industry. I, I find the same problem on Wall Street, when you have an SEC revolving door, uh, Moderna, Pfizer, J&J, &J, these are enormous companies making enormous profits. Now, I'm not suggesting that they exploited a crisis or created a crisis, but these are reasonable concerns for people that there are conflicts of interest between profit and public health. Yeah, I, I was just like tweeting about that today because Scott Gottlieb, I think that's a good example because he's the ex head of FDA, mm -hmm. he's head of Trump's FDA, and he's on the Pfizer board. So when the whole thing started and when I started seeing him, I couldn't have been more wary of the guy. Like he was, he's on the, uh, I think an AI, AEI fellow, like as ideologically mm -hmm. out there from me as possible. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, while I completely acknowledge that this is a major conflict, 
for him to be speaking up. I listened to him throughout like almost three years now. Mm -hmm. And he went on business press. He went on conservative media. And he actually ended up making a lot of sensible points that I thought were informative, Mm -hmm. balanced. He was very wary of vaccine mandates. Uh, He was one of the first people to point out that natural immunity was a thing and it worked, but vaccination was safer. So I found his message correct and actually useful because he could reach people I probably could not. On the other hand, I kept thinking, why is it him? Why isn't there anybody else on Couldn't that side of the Couldn't there be somebody who isn't yes, on the board correct. of the company that correct. made the vaccine? I completely right. And here's the problem. Here's the problem. There wasn't. That side of the political spectrum did not produce people who weren't on the board but of it's, Pfizer. It's not just who, that side of the political spectrum. I mean, the, the, the left side of the political spectrum... Is That's also a different involved picture. With- so what I'm saying is I think he's, he stepped up at a great risk to himself. So created the problem you talk about. Mm-hmm. But on the other hand, points to the fact that where are the people who don't have these conflicts That's who right. could step up? and not have us be discussing something like this. So, so I'll give, that's a really good point. And actually, sort of, I think the response might be illustrative. Two things, but I'll go back to your bigger point, John, mm-hmm. which is, you know, is this a rational thing to talk about? It is, absolutely. And the answer to that is, look, they, we do derive some value as a society for some people to be engaged with vaccine companies so that our science remains credible, it has quality and, and sort of all sorts of robustness. Having said that, as a society, as a community of scientists, there should be a significant fraction of us who don't have that perceived or real conflict of interest. I have chosen to be that person. I don't take any money from a vaccine companies. I don't have not even grants to my institution, etc. I do my own work. Uh, you know, um, I, I pay for my own meals. Uh, in scientific meetings. Dr. Omer, I, how dare they? No, you exactly. pay for your. You know what? If, when I see you, you and me are getting a little grilled cheese sandwich, something. I'm going to so, I'm gonna get you a little something, so, a little so, nosh. No, but, but, but the thing is, even the small stuff, and it's not that I see that there's an inherent ethical flaw with people interacting with vaccine companies. I do believe, on the other hand, that as, as part of the overall ecosystem, you should have a significant proportion of people who, if... Uh, Scott Gottlieb, who's uh, you know serving on the board of Pfizer, is saying the same thing, which is, which passes that sort of scientific litmus test that those mm-hmm. of us who are not engaged with Pfizer or any other company are saying the same thing, so that the overall credibility is somewhat maintained. What we need to do is to better explicate, better communicate what is a conflict of interest and the fact that there are a lot of us who don't do that. The, the, coming back to the other point, so what were these people doing? Well, these people were actually working, doing the trials. So if you have the bandwidth, there mm-hmm. was, there's a very small overlap in that Venn diagram uh, where you were. So I was on several the World Health Organization committees that required that because of their meetings were globally timed, I was waking up on a given morning for the first six, seven months at 5.30 a.m. prepping for the stuff these were vaccine safety data evaluation committee. So we were getting the data almost live. Mm-hmm. This was vaccine recommendation committee. I was doing my own research, vaccine effectiveness research, vaccine effect, uh, acceptance research. Uh, you know, so all, all of that is uh, is out there in, in published literature. So there is that nuance. So uh, because of that vacuum that... You know, if I had to prioritize between tweeting out my own paper and doing the next paper, I know I made that choice. Well, let me let me jump on the word nuance, and I'll, I'll address this to Dr. Poland, because I think, boy, nuance is a word that uh, uh, within any conversation in the 21st century is something that's generally missing. And, and maybe science in particular uh, suffers from that, uh, that feeling of certainty. And I think what what science likes to project is certainty. And I think it's important to draw a distinction between mathematics and science. One plus one is two. But science is really about probabilities. It's really about this vaccine will give you a higher probability of survival than, let's say, just allowing COVID to take its course. This drug will give you high, but nothing is certain. And I think the maybe the myopia that uh, afflicts 
that industry is the projection of certainty and the really the dismissing of nuance. Hmm. So it, it, in some ways, aren't we talking about a problem within the industry as, as a whole in not talking about things as probabilities? Yeah. But you're like looking at the wrong, I, I'm sorry, like, like Dr. Poland go and, and Dr. Also, Poland, yeah. and, and then you yeah. can correct me, professor. Yeah. I will get a B plus on this. Trust me. <laughs> well, we're not. I am teachable. We're not certain. There's a probability, but <laughs> part of the problem uh, is, as you point out, communication and cognitive styles. So, physicians and scientists are professionalized in one style, what cognitively would be called an analytic style. Mm -hmm. Okay, what the population is, if you will, professionalized, is with heuristics, rules of thumb for how they make decisions. Daniel Kahneman won the Nobel Prize for kind of teasing apart how people think and the cognitive biases that they, they bring to this. Mm -hmm. When you think about it, people get vaccines for one of only a few reasons, because they're forced to, because they're bribed to do it. <laughs> bandwagoning, that is peer pressure, and uh -huh. fear. Those are the only four known reasons for right. why people get vaccines. What we tend not to do in the medical and scientific profession, and this is where I would argue we need cultural anthropologists, we need sociologists, we need um, uh, psychologists, linguists at the table, and they're not, they are not, we need them at the table to bring that nuance, because we don't even recognize the cognitive bias that we're using to communicate with. You're right. Mm -hmm. I mean, if I tried to summarize it very simply, I would say um, vaccines save lives, they prevent disease, they prevent disability. Do they have side effects? Yes. But wisdom resides in the balance of those risks and benefits. And in mm -hmm. this case, it's decidedly tipped toward vaccines. However, because there are probabilities of side effects, and this is where the art you, of you medicine- You suffered one, doctor. doctor. I did. Didn't you? Right. I absolutely did. I developed uh, tinnitus, a ringing in my ear after my second dose, worsened after uh, my booster. Um, and we're, we're still trying to work with CDC and others to- focus on, is this a significant side effect from it? But, you know, the point being that you make a decision based on those nuances. And so when you present nuance as certainty, well, common experience is going to mitigate against that. And what you've now done is bred mistrust and skepticism. That, that's right. And, and that breeding mistrust leads to that moment now where uh, a young man is struck down on a football field. And as I'm trying to search Twitter for results on his condition, all I'm getting is died suddenly, young men all collapsing uh, all throughout the world, tens of thousands yeah. of people. I mean, and I, I don't know what to make of any of th it. This came up when Grant uh, Wall died. Um, same, same thing. You know, and, and yet uh, uh, with, with, uh, empathy to his, his spouse, uh, who, who is one of us, uh, an infectious disease doctor. Mm -hmm. You know, she insisted on an autopsy, and uh, recently that autopsy showed he died of an, a ruptured aortic aneurysm. But she made a great point, which is these discussions must take place yes. with empathy and, and, and with data and, Absolutely. and, and with facts. Because I've got to tell you, again, a science-fearing man who's had the vaccines, I'm in that demographic where they told us, you know, you're the people we should keep in the basement and don't do anything for two years. <laughs> but when I see these stories, even for me, there is a part of myself that has a moment of doubt. And pr professor, you know, these are the kinds of things, you know, we keep talking about how people actually behave and how people actually think, you know, look, there are people that lost their jobs because they wouldn't get the vaccine. And we don't, you know, some of them might have been trolls and crazies and things, but some of them might have been reasonably mistrustful of something in their family backgrounds or, or their lives 
that caused them to make that decision, and they paid a pretty stiff penalty for it. Well, and this is really important in our society. I mean, it it it, it becomes what 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 epistemological lens are you going to look through in order to make decisions? Once we reject the scientific method, we're in a world of hurt. But that scientific method needs to be transparent. It needs to mm-hmm. be radically honest. It needs to be communicated with all the humility and nuance. Um, and we need to hear people's stories and their journey and respond to that, not in some sort of reflexive, you know, uh, scientific way as much as we do in an empathetic way. Right. Professor. So I'm going to put on my sociologist hat because I'm, uh, again, and I'm going to slightly disagree. I don't think anybody's making that kind of individual decisions really because. I know, I know. Because see, this is the thing. This is what people don't understand about scientists. There's no people that love arguing more. Like if you don't like arguing in doubt, it's the wrong profession for you. So that's why, like, this is what we do. We argue most with the people we love. Peer review. That said, uh, that said, when you get up, go to the airport, and line up to get in in an aluminum tin whatever can yes. that's going to hurl you in the sky <laughs> that's right at like that kind of speed at mm-hmm. 30,000 feet you are not doing your own research you are not considering this and that you're not using the scientific method you are trusting the institutions and because the institutions have delivered it's not like airplane flying was always safe. They're like planes, but after there's an accident, there is transparency, there is accountability, there's research, there's experience. You keep getting on the plane and it keeps ending up. I mean, it's otherwise an insane thing to do. Like we just sit there and like get, you put a, I don't know, a hundred chimps there and there'd be no limbs left by the end of that thing. We're a very sort of passive social uh, species. By the way, a hundred chimps is actually Southwest's new motto. <laughs> so we're, there you go. But so the thing is, it, when you drink, when, John, when you go to the, air, uh, to the supermarket and mm-hmm. you buy salad or chicken or something That's right. and when you don't you don't go to your own basement and try to understand does this have e coli you don't have an expertise in bacteriology you are not really using the scientific method because you cannot even though i'm a great fan of vaccines when somebody injects me with that vaccine i haven't tested what's in it i haven't checked if they screwed up the dose i haven't checked if it's the right dial That's right. i am putting my trust in institutions Mm -hmm. that I'm expecting to function in a particular way. I'm expecting them to work on my um, behalf. I'm expecting them to be transparent. I'm not expecting them to be perfect, but I want them to be trying. This is why the conflicts of interest are important. This is why the revolving doors are important. This Mm -hmm. is why, you know, right now the FDA, FAA, uh, the SEC, all of our institutions have been captured defanged, Mm -hmm. corrupted, uh, EPA including. Like there's a lot of good people there. There's an enormous number of people who are trying to do their best, but they keep getting out lobbied, the industry revolving doors. Um, You see this in the tech industry. Half the Obama White House went to the tech industry Mm -hmm. uh, and like went they, they go back and forth. This is how do you get good tech regulation in that kind of environment? So there's a way in which... Our institutions are failing us. I don't think it is fair to expect any single person to, quote unquote, do their own research and read a, you know, all these right. scientific papers and try to, because you will be confused. There's a reason why Dr. Omer and Dr. Poland are reading and writing those papers, because it took years and years of training. Mm-hmm. It took a lot of understanding. It takes, I see this all the time on Twitter. Somebody will have a screenshot from a um, paper. And we'll say, look, they found this. And that sentence does say that. But there's like 30 paragraphs before it, yeah. putting it in context. No context. Right. It yeah. doesn't right. say that. Like it, so the thing is, what we need, and this is what I think um, so important to, this is, I think there's like the sort of, what's the right word, mirage, that mm-hmm. we can empower individuals to navigate this. And I'm convinced that you cannot empower individuals one by one. What you need is functioning institutions that, yes, communicate properly, do their best, empower people. Individuals can be, though, 
a powerful check on institutions. Yeah. Correct. And, I, and, and they and are I think partners you need in that this. as part of the ecosystem that helps cleanse it. And I'm talking about being able to discern between those who are bad faith actors. And believe me, in the vaccine debate, there are a lot of bad faith actors, but there are also people who are uh, genuinely concerned. And unfortunately, when these institutions struggle, the real victims, not just the public, but the rank and file in those industries, the nurses and the doctors who are on the front lines and who are dealing with, in clinical settings, that mistrust or that hostility or that anger while putting themselves at great personal risk on the front lines of a pandemic that we still don't quite understand. And, and now, now that we've gone into sort of quadratic equation variants, you know, as it, as it moves along, I still don't know, you know, when we talk about polio and we talk about smallpox, there was an eradication to it. And that became our expectation. And this follows much more of maybe a flu model than it does with an eradication, but that certainly was not the expectation in the beginning of this. And, and it's been difficult for them to communicate the ephemeral nature of these different variants and the different things that went. And I agree with you guys. I think there needs to be almost a peer review about that linkage between the institutions of science and the public that they serve. Well, you know, you're, you're really arguing for this idea of, of trust in institutions. And, and how do you build it? And, and let me just give you one right. example. The, sure. the vaccination rate for COVID in Denmark is among the highest in the world. Oh, they love their vaccinations. And there's that a reason for that. Harry. They trust their government. They trust their public health officials. Trust has to be earned, though. It trust has, yes. to be, has to be earned. Yes, it has to be absolutely. earned. Absolutely. No question right. about it. And Denmark was one of the first countries to be able to drop a lot of mitigation measures. Right. They like they did. So uh, they were the first to be able to get over the worst part of the pandemic because right. all the things other people complain about, the lockdowns, the mass, the this and that. Denmark showed how you can get out of it as quickly as possible when you have functioning institutions. What they did right. is they said, okay, we think it's safe to take masks off now. And then when it surged, they said, okay, put your masks back on. And the population yeah. trusted them and did it. And they navigated right. the pandemic really very well. Dr. Omer. Coming back to trust. So a lot of my research group is now focusing on how do you develop the science around trust? And it's, it's work in progress. Stay tuned. But what we know so far, in terms of public health institutions specifically, there are three dimensions of trust. Mm -hmm. One is perceived um, empathy. So the, the, the entity has my interest at heart. Mm -hmm. The other part is perceived lack of conflict of interest. Mm -hmm. uh, so these are overlapping, but slightly different things, but, but we already discussed that. The third thing is perceived competence. And, and as much as I love my colleague at, at the CDC, uh, we had falling down of actual competence, not in the area of vaccine safety. I've been paying attention. This is what I do for a living. Vaccine mm -hmm. safety was delayed. So, so the, the problem there was the systems were so sclerotic. And the fact that they have uh, this kind of the, what they call scientific review, internal review, mm -hmm. which uh, I think Dr. Poland has also suffered through that. When if you have if you have even one CDC author, it goes through this this uh, black hole of review, which doesn't add to the science. Mm -hmm. Because of that, there was a delay in the safety science come out. But there were a lot a lot of other scientific shortcomings, like not paying attention to genomic surveillance, like what Professor uh, um, Tofikchi alluded to, the fact about ending isolation after five days without testing uh, or, or sort of broader isolation guidance, not relying on rapid tests. Let's stand six feet away from each other, but only for 15 minutes and only if <laughs> yeah. you're in a laboratory. But and, if you walk outside, then you got to put a hood over your head, but then you got to wait. I mean, it, it, it really got crazy. This goes back e even further than that. I mean, uh, very early on in the pandemic, I published an editorial. My colleagues panned it. It got published, and it was, I called it the tortoise and the hare, and I predicted at that point this S-only approach to vaccines was doomed to fail, and that's mm -hmm. exactly what's happened. And what it uncovered was the relative lack of 
understanding. I've studied RNA respiratory viruses for 40 years, and right. it made you realize that there was not a deep understanding of the hypermutability of this virus. And this virus was going to change very rapidly. So unilateral, one-sided, we're going to deal with this variant was doomed to fail. The result of this, absent you know some really important advances in vaccinology, absent those, your great, great, great grandchildren are going to be getting vaccines against coronavirus. That's the ultimate implication of all this. So, so yeah. So to build on that, um, right. one of the things that we have fallen short is that we it was supposed to be a relay. And we, after one or two legs, we gave up on the development program in, in all its force. There was, uh, that no, was, more needed. Funding. There was yeah. no more funding and no more sort of serious effort to develop the next generation of vaccines. For example, the pan-coronavirus vaccine. So these are the government is still investing in this. But to be fair, you're also, again, none of this is occurring in a vacuum. So you're also up against a society that is suffering in isolation. And that is ultimately that mission accomplished problem. Mm. You've got school kids yep. that are home. You've got people that can't go out. And so everybody's rushing to have that moment on a battleship with a big sign, rather than explaining that for all our human progress, this prehistoric, you know, microscopic being, this virus can still have its way with a population and, and still, uh, you know, cause us great pain. And it seems like, and we can talk about the state of play right now, which is rather than losing a million people a year, we've sort of settled into this acceptance of a thousand deaths a week. And that's where we're at. Well, let's uh, let's 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 be fair, though. This is OK. Here's the thing. I I take what you're saying. Mm -hmm. And coronaviruses like the other four human coronaviruses also reinfect, you know, uh, quite often. Mm -hmm. We had a pandemic. Mm -hmm. And within nine months of its sort of official start, we had vaccines that were and still are incredible at severity, death, hospitalization across the board. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the current things, if you get the updated uh, vaccine recently, the even for like rates of death and hospitalization, even among the most frail and elderly, right. are very, very low. Most of our deaths is because we have not taken up the booster. If you look at countries like Singapore, other countries that track this really well, mm -hmm. they also have the Omicron. They also have the mutated one, but their death rates, their hospitalization rates are very, very low. So it's not that the vaccine is, it could be better. I would love a pan-coronavirus vaccine, but the one we have, if we used it, would have gotten us so much better out of this. And on top of this, there's the question of long COVID, which for a minority of people is mm -hmm. very debilitating. And those people, oh, and terrible. this is what I want to say, you need to get there like the firefighters after 9-11. The long COVID patients really? are the firefighters of this pandemic. They're being left behind. Really? Everybody wants to, yes. Le left behind Everybody in the sense that, that medical science is not looking into it or in, in what way? It's not looking into it anywhere near enough. There's not enough. There's not new funding in the new bill. Mm -hmm. These people are very sick. How pre prevalent is this? Somewhere around ten to twenty percent of people who what? develop COVID have a complication or a long COVID. It's it's significant number. Yeah, but the severe one is lower than that. Yes, the severe one that we're talking about is okay. much lower because if it was 10 to 20 percent, you'd say it. If you look at the United Kingdom, which uh, calculates this really well because we don't have good epidemiology in the U.S., they find about half a percent of the population right. is severely affected. That's like a couple of million people, perhaps, mm -hmm. like half a percent. Wow. And these people have been sick for more than a year, most of them. Most of it is pre-vaccine. You have the occasional post-vaccine, but that's rarer. Mm -hmm. And even though Congress allocated a billion to it like two years ago, the very first trial from it, from that billion, 2023, is starting now. Right. There's no new money for it. And these people are so sick, so severely sick, that they can't protest. Do you think this is because we're, we're still kind of fighting on, you know, that we haven't opened up that second front? No, we want to move on. 
We want to move on. Look, after 1918, we got the Roaring Twenties. Who people like after 9/11? People want to move on right. and get on with their lives. And there's a small but substantial number of people who right. are very sick, who are the true casualties of this pandemic. After the people who died, and that we want to move away from. Well, the 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 issue. I, I don't think it's quite as simple as 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 what you're saying. The 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 issue tends to be one more systemic in medicine. Uh, look, there, there were post-infection syndromes after influenza, after Lyme disease, after mm -hmm. a variety of infections. What tends to happen in medicine is that entities we don't understand tend to get ignored. So what we need to address this issue, and it will have implications beneficial uh, across medicine, is mm -hmm. the right funding for things like this. It, it really is difficult to begin to categorize, to develop biomarkers, to understand syndromes. We talk about long COVID as if it's one thing. It's not. That's a wastebasket diagnosis. It's mm -hmm. multiple things, different what we would call clinical phenotypes. Some people have neurologic predominant uh, long COVID, other people cardiac, other people psychologic and psychiatric. Uh, mm -hmm. diabetes, uh, difficulty with uh, thinking and brain fog. So there are different kinds of, of, quote, long COVID, probably related to severity of disease and to genetic predisposition and, and other issues, even what variant they might have gotten infected with. So you mm -hmm. need to, you need for, for academic investigators to get interested in this, they need funding to carry out these studies. 100% agree with this, by the way. We're not disagreeing at all. Yeah. I totally agree with what you said, yeah. Let me make a suggestion to that then, because, you know, in a lot of ways, and, and listen, there's not a lot of transparency in this it, it, at all, but there's a lot of mistrust over kind of virus research, right? And mm. DARPA and the various things that are going along. Perhaps if we were to look at long COVID as a national security uh, effect and get some of that sweet, sweet $850 billion of funding that goes to the Defense Department, which goes towards weaponizing all sorts of varieties of things, we could make some real headway on this. And maybe that's the shift that has to take place, is that it's not just altruistic doctors in their spare time at 5.30 in the morning faxing things. It's the United States government recognizing long COVID and, and these uh, issues as a national security and And John, problem. I would agree. It is a national security issue in this regard. It is an economic issue. And of it's course. an economic issue among our most, if you will, productive segment age-wise of the population. So this is a real issue. So you don't have to be an altruist. So there's a paper out the, earlier in 2022 that multiple sclerosis, which um, is wasn't really understood for a long time, in fact is uh, follows from an Epstein-Barr virus infection decades earlier. Wow. As Dr. It's a post-infection. Pro correct. Pro probably. As probably. Probably. Th but that probably. science is in firm. Always, always, always. always. But uh, the, I, uh, it's a great study, and it's a very strong study. And as Dr. Poland was saying, uh, we had post-viral infectious diseases following the 1918 pandemic. Yeah. Right. We've had uh, something we call ME-CFS, which is 75% of the victims traced to a viral infection, and then they, it's, a, it's a baffling disease. There's a bunch of things. In, uh, after, for example, there's a randomized trial mm -hmm. that shows that uh, if you get the influenza vaccine versus not on people who had already heart disease, uh, the influenza vaccine cut all-cause mortality and cardiovascular mortality by like an astonishing two-thirds. But even that, you know, that, that's a really smart way to put it because one of the problems that we have is some of the side effects of the vaccine mirror the effects of COVID. Of so now you've got this all in the mix and those who wish to create havoc will look at right. those and say, oh, that, that wasn't 
COVID, that was the vaccine. So, but so, I'm so. pitching you, John. We no. need post-viral research <laughs> money yes. because there's all these. Uh, you don't not need only to pitch the, me. I'm with you. Uh, no, but you need to be out there because oh. the thing is, right. uh, <laughs> she's giving the, you an the, assignment. The, oh, I, I didn't I'm realize, giving you an assignment. I didn't realize so, there was an assignment. So the thing is, like, there are other uh, pe like neurological complications. The there's a huge rise in, say, Alzheimer diagnoses after oh, both boy. influenza okay. and COVID infections. So the the post-viral yeah world is potentially the next frontier. And we have in long COVID, a large number of people left behind, like the firefighters were left behind. And so we have to, we have to view this as an opportunity to really make some progress. We need funding, but apparently Congress doesn't allocate funding unless a very talented, hmm. super handsome, charming, no. what? wonderful. I, well, uh, <laughs> give, give me the name of this fella because I'll go, I'll go find him and I'll go make him do it. goes and yells at them uh, at the galleys yeah, and brings some of his friends along. Do you have the phone number for Julia Roberts, by the way, that I'd <laughs> no, like her I don't. to? She's not actually Erin Brockovich. She's just Julia. Well, the, the, the policy people can't always tell the difference. And so this is, we bring some friends along too. Understood. Guys, I want to thank you all so much. I know you're, you're, you're awfully busy. Uh, this is a conversation that I feel like uh, needs to be had more frequently and more publicly. And I truly do appreciate it. And I know uh, the pressure that all of you are under uh, to get things right. And also from a public that is, mistrustful and toxic and uh, all those different things. Uh, Dr. Gregory Poland, Dr. Sadomer, uh, Professor Zainab Tufeci, thank you so much uh, for being a part of the discussion today. Wonderful. Thank you again. Thank you. Woo! Shit got heated! <laughs> Boom! No, I actually thought, you know, it was really interesting. I don't know how you guys felt, but to hear the people that are really involved in, in the day-to-day -day talk about how they felt like everything was mismanaged and, right. and what a detriment that was to all the good things that were actually happening. I, I thought I was crazy this whole time. I thought it was just me being like, oh, what is this, what is this uh, uh, confusion, mask, no mask? What's the difference between this vaccine, that mm -hmm. vaccine? Should I do it now? Can my kids really get it? What's going on? And it was like, no, just take it, just take it. And I thought that I was, you know, I wasn't patriotic enough. I didn't trust the science enough right. because I was simply hesitant. And now I can hear from three professionals that like, no, 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 there was, there was some, you know, some messiness going on. Yeah. And I think it was just so interesting for the first time hearing, like, whenever there's something going on that you don't know, it's okay to ask questions. Yes. Like, but it was not made to seem like it was okay to ask questions. And the only grace that I'll offer, I, I thought the key word of the whole thing was humility. And I think that's the thing that wasn't afforded. And you can give grace to decisions made in the heat of catastrophe. But I think... The hard part is getting people to separate malevolence from incompetence, from situational difficulties. And that's the thing that I think we weren't able to do. Do, do you think, do y'all think that we've gotten past the point of trying to build trust with the American public? I, I, I thought that was like the, the, the comparison between Denmark and America and the vaccine numbers mm -hmm. when it comes to building trust, I just thought was interesting. It's just like, where do you even start? I feel like trust has become a partisan decision. Like you choose a side and then that's right. when they're in power, that's what you trust. Like, Oh, that's I, interesting. Like, I, right. I guess Takara was saying, like talking about the, like building trust and how that's different in America. Like I, it's just interesting to me. But you have to think that again, Denmark is a homogenous country. Yes. Mm -hmm. I know there are migrants coming in, but it's pretty homogenous. Mm -hmm. And here in the United States of America, we have so many different groups of people who have very distinct and specific relationships with the United States and with institutions within the United States and with, and with the medical system, yeah, no question. with healthcare. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, that really affects a lot of decisions. You know, I was watching um, Amani Barbarin. Uh, I don't know if you remember her, John. She's the one who has that great quote about, like, you know, if they call you a hero, that means they're willing to die. But yeah, she was yeah. talking about vaccines and vaccination hesitancy. And she was saying, you know, it's, it's really a shame uh, that people can't ask questions anymore, one. Mm -hmm. But it's also really scary that um, because they're not asking, because people are, aren't allowed to ask questions, they tend to 
uh, turned to a pipeline that is very alt-right. And we're seeing that with a lot of older black people going incredibly conservative, incredibly QAnon, simply because they're not able to ask these questions. And so it's either, are you going to take it or are you not going to take it? And it's, well, I'm not going to take it. And this is exactly what happened at Tuskegee. This is exactly what happened with mm-hmm. gynecology. And it becomes part of that, well, true storytelling and then also part of a little bit of mythology that's being created on the alt-right. I always think, you know, it's not that we can't ask questions, is that we're not very effective at answering them and people accepting those answers. You know, it's a lot of those conspiracies are always, I'm just asking questions. You're like, you're not just asking questions. <laughs> you're sowing doubt right. because when people answer those questions, you're not accepting those answers. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and, but Dr. Poland did something that I thought fascinating in that interview. He actually read the statistics on myocarditis. Hmm. And when I heard that, I was like, why have I never fucking heard that before? Such clarity. With such clarity. Why is it so hard? And I think as much as we mistrust institutions, institutions mistrust us. And that's part of the issue is that they believe, as someone once said, we can't handle the truth. Who said it? I'm uh, not familiar. It might have been a, a, a gentleman by the name of the Joker. I was going to say Johnny Cochran. It's uh, it's Nicholson. It's Jack Nicholson. Okay, got it. Uh, in a it's few just good, my notes. In a few good <laughs> You can't handle the truth! <laughs> I should have said it in that way so that it was a lot clearer. But, <laughs> but, but that's the part of it. And in a divided country where there's mistrust in institutions, I would actually say our response to the pandemic has been remarkably successful. With all the infighting and all the other things, the fact that we've got 60 to 70% of fucking anything in this country is is kind of shocking. I, when it comes to misinformation, like I just hope that people realize that everything, every single thing you're reading about DeMar Hamlin and his heart condition related to the vaccine, none of that is based on the doctors who treated him. One hundred. None of the doctors said a word. They just taking selfies with his well, body. Of course and being they like, They're uh, in bed with the pharmaceutical company. Like, uh, <laughs> they get a cut, for God's sakes. Don't you know anything? <laughs> Dr. Wilson, at long last, sir. Thank you, man. There's a lot of professors I'll prove wrong if I got that doctor before my uh, These are the, I'm telling you, man, this is why I, I have truly enjoyed doing this podcast. Because you're allowed to kind of grab some people that are pertinent to conversations that you feel like are intractable and to, to step, to deconstruct them and step through it. I, right. I, I just, it, it's, it's invigorating. To I can't extent. recall which of the doctors said it, but I think there was like, oh, you know, there's a mother in one room who's like, you know, if I don't get my kid the vaccine and they get sick, I, I, I feel horrible. And another mother saying, if my kid gets the vaccine and they get sick, I'm going to feel horrible. And that's mm-hmm. such a representation of what people are feeling, whether it's yes. like making their older parents go get vaccinated, their children go get vaccinated themselves. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, I'm the only caregiver. What if something happens to me? What if I? What if it makes me sick anyway? And I still miss work. And I just started this job. Like, I can't. I think... There's so much nuance to this hesitancy, and it doesn't always mean that someone is like re- related to some political sphere or conspiracy yes. theory. There's so much nuance to the hesitancy. And I'm going to share here that uh, I had a baby in 2021. Mm-hmm. And when it was time for her to go get vaccinated, I was like, I am going to need some time. Hell because yeah. she literally sneezed when she saw the sun for the first time. <laughs> So who knows? <laughs> who knows what this vaccine is going to do to her? You know that's a real phenomenon, right? With newborns, they leave the hospital, Can I tell you the something? sunlight hits them and they're like <laughs> and they're like what is that? I still do that. If I look at Don't the, do this. I swear to you. If I look at the sun right, I can sneeze. I swear to you. If I feel the tickle and I catch the sun right, I can sneeze. If that's not on your acting resume, you are, you're doing the wrong. <laughs> Can sneeze when it's Special not raining. Special talents. <laughs> Good shit, guys. As always, an absolute pleasure. And uh, yeah, we'll talk again when Harry uh, has the sequel book where he reveals 
I don't know what he's going to talk about. Forty million dollar book deal. There better be a sequel. You can. I gotta get the money's worth. Let's go. I'll tell you everything you want to know. I'm very good at bullet points. Don't you worry. I will keep you up to date. 